This is a story of wandering in the wilderness too long. Two and a half years, 40 years, 80 years, 155 years. And this is the story of why. And this is the story of lo looking into the promise and losing faith and finding it again. Two and a half years, 40 years, 80 years, 155 years. The first chapter, two and a half years. The night of December 31st, 1862 was known as Watch Night. The next day would bring the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing of slaves in all rebelling states. Black people gathered all night in churches in the north and around praying trees in secret locations in the south, waiting for the dawn, for God to fulfill the promise of freedom. Frederick Douglass wrote that they waited for a day of poetry and song, a new song. These cloudless skies, this balmy air, this brilliant sunshine, making December as pleasant as May, are in harmony with the glorious morning of liberty about to dawn upon us. As light dawned on that new day and that new year, one could look out to the horizon and almost hear freedom ringing. And yet it was two and a half years before freedom's bells were heard across Texas. It was two and a half years after emancipation on July 19th that the order to free all the slaves was nailed to the door of Reedy Chapel African American Methodist Episcopal Church in Galveston and the final slaves in America were technically freed. Technically because <clears throat> slave owners in the South did not give up their slaves just because General Gordon Granger occupied the state and demanded it. And some states in the North did not fully abolish slavery until the 13th Amendment was finally ratified. But it was two and a half years before the enslaved men and women of Texas could feel the warmth of that balmy air that Douglas wrote about on watch night. Two and a half years of staying in the wilderness, trying to hold on to hope. This is the story of wandering in the wilderness too long. Two and a half years, 40 years, 80 years, 155 years. Second chapter, 40 years. A year and a half after the Israelites left slavery in Egypt, they stood at the border of the promised land. In this week's Parsha, Moses sends out 12 spies to reconnoiter the land. They trek across it for 40 days and return, reporting that the land is indeed flowing with milk and honey. The grapes, they said, were so big that a single bunch had to be carried between two people. But 10 of the spies were afraid. They had seen the local inhabitants and their walled cities, and they said it was like looking up at giants. They said, we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, and so we must have looked to them. Only Joshua and Caleb kept faith. They did not dispute the observations of their colleagues, only their conclusions. Somehow, they saw the land full of giant produce and people and said, God will keep God's promise. If we are meant to be a free people in a home of our own, then we will go forth into the unknown with faith, an impossibility we cannot yet see. But the people lacked the vision of Caleb and Joshua, and they sided with the ten. They rebelled against Moses and God, wishing they could just die in the wilderness, their freedom not yet fully realized. They stood at the very border of promise and could not imagine crossing over. God decrees that this generation will never cross over into the promised land. They will wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the last of that generation is gone. Only their children will be truly free. Nobody but Joshua and Caleb would answer freedom's call. For the rest, their dreams were deferred the moment they stopped believing in them. This is the story of wandering in the wilderness too long, two and a half years, 40 years, 80 years, 155 years. The third chapter, 80 years. When Miss Opal Lee was 13 years old, a white mob showed up at her house. They wanted to burn the place. The police were there, but they did nothing. Opal's father had a shotgun, but when he reached for it, a police officer officer threatened that if he fired his gun, the police would hand him and his family over to the ravenous mob. So Opal and her parents watched as their house burned to the ground. That was June 19th, 1940. 80 years later, that lot still sits empty. Its absence is like an inverted memorial, a space where one might be called to reflect on progress made or not made between 1865 and 1940, between 1940 and now. 
Miss Opalisto passes by that negative memorial sometimes on her daily two and a half mile walks. Mrs. Lee, now a spry 93, is a leader in the movement to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Every day she walks two and a half miles in the morning and two and a half miles in the evening, collecting them together in her symbolic march from Fort Worth to Washington. She's walked in states all over the country, each walk representing those two and a half years between when Texas's slaves were emancipated and when they knew it. Yesterday, her march was supported by other walkers celebrating Juneteenth and by a line of cars socially distanced as they followed slowly behind in solidarity. She has a petition she started a few years ago thinking she might get 100,000 signatures. As of late last night, it had 700,000. Juneteenth is a unifier, she says. Slaves weren't free on the 4th of July and everybody celebrates the 4th of July. So if we could channel some of that energy into the 19th of June, oh, it would be wonderful. Hopa Lee has trekked through the wilderness for 80 years from the day the mob came for her family to this one, a day where, she dream, where her dream feels closer than ever. Her fight is symbolic. She told the New York Times that she hopes that a Juneteenth observance is paired with more equity in education, in employment, in healthcare. Though she's seen progress, she knows her fight is not yet done, so she will keep walking, though she knows the walk to freedom is never easy. Miss Opal Lee refuses to remain in the wilderness. What makes the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the other spies? Why do some lose hope and perish in the wilderness and others charge forward to build a world they cannot yet imagine? The people who believed in the 10 spies had witnessed the plagues in Egypt and the parting of the sea just a year earlier. They had known revolutionary change and emancipation in their lifetime and yet, Though they stood at the banks of the river waiting to cross over into possibility, they could not move an inch further. It was, more than anything, a failure of imagination. The key word in this story of the spies repeated over and over is Latour, which means to see. It's an uncommon word in the Torah, and here it appears 12 times, emphasizing that the spies' task, and ultimately their failure, was one of vision. The spies fail because they put stock only in what they can see. They perceive the giants, the fortified cities, and they start to believe that these facts are immutable. Remember, they say, we were in our eyes like grasshoppers, and so we must have seemed in their eyes. Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotzk points out that they're entitled to the first half of that sentiment, we felt small, but not to the second. To them, we surely looked small. How could the spies possibly know what the inhabitants thought of them? But they had turned what they saw, giants, into a feeling, we felt small, into an unchangeable reality. To them, we are grasshoppers. From then on, there is no hope for change or possibility. They have let their inward experience dictate their external reality. In their short-sightedness, they have put an end to possibility. Only Joshua and Caleb possess vision beyond what the eye can see. Only they can look to the future, to God's promise, and say, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Do not be afraid, because God is with us. Rashi, for instance, points out that the walled cities were a sign of the inhabitants' weakness, not their strength. If the people were truly as strong and gigantic as they appeared, what need would they have to fortify their cities? The stories the spies told themselves had hidden from them the reality of possibility. Rabbi Shai Held writes that, the, that ultimately the question posed by the text is whether what we imagine possible is limited to what we see before us or whether we can discern possibilities not immediately apparent to the eye. Because the people fail to heed the vision of Joshua and Caleb because they see the size of the task ahead of them and mistake difficulty for impossibility they are doomed to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the story of wandering in the wilderness too long, two and a half years, 40 years, 80 years, 155 years. It has been 155 years since the Declaration of Emancipation was nailed to that church door in Galveston. 155 years, which we were told were the promised land, but which for Black Americans have been a wilderness. 
with slavery traded for sharecropping, with lynching, with mobs and riots like the one that burned Miss Opalee's home or the one in Tulsa that leveled Black Wall Street and destroyed over 1,200 homes and killed upwards of 300 people, with Jim Crow and segregation, with mass incarceration and police violence, it's easy to let our eyes tell us a story like the spies. It's easy to feel like grasshoppers in the face of racial injustice. It's easy to let our privilege, our insecurity, our shame silence us. We might look out and see those giants, those walled cities and tell ourselves a story. I see the scope of injustice. I feel small in the face of it. So it must be impossible to change. But we must be like Joshua and Caleb and Miss Opal Lee who know that just because it appears this way does not mean it has to be this way. The failures in our past will only dictate the injustice in our future if we let them. We can stand up like Joshua and Caleb and say, do not be afraid. We can, we can be like the abolitionist minister, Theodore Parker, who in 1853 wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. The trajectory of the moral arc of the universe is not yet set. We can bend it. The work ahead of us is great. It will not be solved by marches alone any more than it will be solved by making Juneteenth a national holiday. Our portion opens with the command, Shalach Lecha, send out for yourselves to see. What well, we might also translate it as go into yourself and see. The work of justice begins with our internal work with looking inside ourselves and confronting our own bias and our own failures of vision. This is not work that happens in a day or a week, but over the course of years. Years we spend wandering in the wilderness, but years where we do not have to wander alone, where we can stumble together in community and across lines of difference. Years we spend looking out towards the horizon so when that dawn comes, we might be ready to cross over into the land of promise where all God's children are free. Before Joshua leads the Israelites over the Jordan to the promised land, Moses gives him one final blessing. Chazak ve'ematz, be strong and courageous. May we too know this blessing of strength and courage as we work together to build a world that is more just, more fair, and more free.